All right. Well, we're going to talk this morning about one of America's favorite subjects, celebrities. And actually, we're going to talk about the greatest celebrity in history, the world's greatest celebrity. Now, who do you think that would be? Some people might, you know, from a biblical perspective here, you know, some people might say Jesus. I'm going to show you that that is that he's not a celebrity. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. The Jesus of the Bible, and I have to say it that way because there's a lot of people have different ideas about who Jesus was. A lot of times it's not founded on Scripture. But uh, the Jesus of the Bible was not a celebrity. I'm going to show you here in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 5. Um, Isaiah chapter 53 is actually prophecies about the Jewish Messiah that would come. And Jesus came and he fulfilled all the prophecies. And yet the Orthodox Jews reject Jesus Christ. But it's interesting because Orthodox Jews don't like to discuss Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, they don't like going there because and comparing it to Jesus Christ because that proves Jesus is the Messiah. Anyhow, let's start out here. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, if you're a celebrity, you have to be good looking. You know, Jesus wasn't. So that's a horrible thing to say. It says it right there. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. That doesn't work too good for a celebrity. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Those are not the qualifications of a celebrity. And uh, to go on there, James 4, 4, you should know this one, says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, Jesus Christ was God, manifest in the flesh, you know, what it was and is, so obviously he couldn't be the enemy of God. You know, Luke 16, verse 15, Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Jesus Christ was not a celebrity. All right, now he will eventually be ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords here physically on the earth, but uh, that hasn't happened yet. So who was the greatest celebrity in history? Well, according to the Bible, his name was King Solomon. And we're going to look at the life of King Solomon today. I'm going to show you that he was a celebrity on a level that nobody in Hollywood or these big billionaires and international bankers and all that, none of them even came close to the life that Solomon lived. Solomon lived a life that, as far as worldly possessions and worldly achievements, you couldn't get any better than King Solomon. We're going to see some amazing things here today about this man. Now, what are four qualifications to be a celebrity in this world? If you want to pick somebody who's a celebrity, they have to have four things. Fame, they have to be famous, right? They have to have money, fortune, in other words. They have to be wise. You know, we worship education, you know, oh, he's got a PhD, wow, you know. They have to have wisdom, and they have to, if, if you're talking about a man, they have to be popular with women. Right? You know, look at the big celebrity movie stars, the men. Oh, he's dating a supermodel. Oh, he's dating another supermodel. Oh, he's dating another supermodel. <laughs> now, they've been married however many times and whatever. That's one of the things. You know, if you have a guy who's popular and you don't see him with, with pretty women, well, it'd be kind of like, oh, you know, he's not really that great. So those are the four qualifications there. Let's look at the first one, King Solomon's fame. 
Now we're going to go back here in the Old Testament to 1 Kings chapter 10. This study this morning is going to be mostly in the Old Testament. We don't spend a lot of time back there, um, but it's going to be mostly in the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 1. <clears throat> Okay, it says here, And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. She said, I don't know if this guy is so smart. I'm going to come and see if he is. Verse 2, And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendants of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no spirit in her. <laughs> she was just like, blown away like I just can't believe this I just I've never seen anything like it verse 6 and she said to the king it was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom howbeit I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it and behold the half was not told me thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard happy are thy men happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes the Lord will reveal the truth to a heathen, you know. And we're going to see later that Solomon actually, because of the things that he had, he actually forsook the Lord. And it's kind of like, I think God kind of brought this pagan queen of Sheba brought her in and had her proclaim the truth to him kind of as a reminder, hey, God is the one that gave you all this stuff. Interesting. Verse 10, And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold and of spices very great store and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, harps and also, harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Was he famous? Yes. You say, well, these, these were kind of, you know, if you have the evolutionary mindset that most people do, you know, here in America and over in the UK and things, most people have this mentality that they were kind of primitive, cave-like people back then. Quite the opposite. They were far more advanced than we, we are right now. You know, much healthier, much wealthier, <laughs> much wiser. I think they were really something else back then. We're going to see that as we continue. These were not just, you know, oh, you, I got a rock here and that makes me rich. No, these, you're going to see the wealth here. Now we're, we saw the fame there in the first part. Now we're going to look at his fortune, what kind of money he had. And this is going to blow you away. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14 is where we're going to start reading. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score and six talents of gold. Now we're just going to stop there for a minute or two here. What was the number there? Six hundred three score and six. Where does that appear in the Bible in another place? It kind of sounds like Revelation 13, doesn't it? The mark of the beast being six hundred three score and six. A score in the Bible is 20. Three score would be 60. So how much gold did he make in one year? 666 talents. 
you say, well, you know, that what's a what's a talent? You know, how much is that? Well, there's a lot of different numbers. A lot of different people have estimates and everything. Some say 96, some say 120, some say 150 pounds is what one talent would be. But for the sake of this study, we'll just average it out. Okay, we'll say one talent equals 100 pounds. Okay, that's actually figuring a little bit low, but we'll go with that. One pound equals, or I'm sorry, one talent equals 100 pounds. So if you multiply that times 666 talents, that would be 66,600 pounds of gold in one year. Now there's 16 ounces in one pound. All right. If you want to buy gold, you're going to have it, they figure by the cost of an ounce. That's what you have right now. So 66,600 pounds times 16 ounces would be 1,065,600 ounces of gold. You say, well, what's that translate to in money? Well, this is where it gets interesting. When I was doing the sermon, I checked monex.com, M-O-N-E-X.com. It's a precious metals dealer, and they stay up to date with what the value of gold is. And at the time I was doing the sermon, gold was at $1,661 an ounce. Okay, And it's interesting because when the market closed Friday night, it was at $1,666 an ounce. <laughs> kind of interesting timing. Yeah. You know, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I figured it up. 1,000, or I'm sorry, 1,065,600 ounces times 1,666 dollars an ounce would be 1,775,289,600. And the difference, I had actually originally added it up in the morning when it was only sixteen sixty one an ounce. And that, that $5 change, the difference between the two, which, which he would have made from morning till evening, is 5328000 Wow. Just from $5 change in, in the price of an ounce. Now, I just want to just say something here. One billion, one point seven billion in gold physical gold these big billionaires that you hear of today the the what's the microsoft guy uh, bill gates, bill gates yeah. and uh donald chump and all that you know <laughs> these these different guys all these guys you hear oh he's a billionaire what's his billions in it's in phony paper money if you said I want you to get your hands on $1.7 billion in physical gold. They couldn't do it. There's no way. You take the most rich, the, the Rockefeller, the Rothschild, the J.P. Morgan, well, he's not alive, but his descendants, you know, Goldman Sachs, all these guys, you take them and you say, I want to see $1.7 billion in physical gold. They couldn't produce it if their life depended on it. And this is what Solomon made in one year. Not his life savings, it took him all of his life, one year, $1.7 billion in physical gold. It's a little bit of money. But let's continue here in the verse uh, 15. Beside that he had of the merchantmen, and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia, and of the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold, 600 shekels of gold went to one target, and he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. You know, <laughs> right there, again, can you imagine a throne of ivory? That would be impressive. But to take the ivory and put gold over top of it. <laughs> We're talking some serious money here. I mean, how many people have gold even in their possession? Not too many. How many people sit on a chair of gold? <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any. Just amazing. Uh, verse 19. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays, 
and twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps, there was not the like made in any kingdom. And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. Now look at this. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Solomon, you know, you'd come and you'd say, look, I have silver, you know, pure silver American Eagle, you know, 0.999 in purity. He'd be like, scrap metal. Mm -hmm. Get that junk out of here. <laughs> we'll make, uh, I don't know, something out of that, you know, just use that as scrap metal. <laughs> incredible. Absolutely incredible. He not only sat on gold, he drank out of gold. You know, we get excited, you know, company comes over, you get out the fine glass, yeah. you know, cups <laughs> instead of the plastic ones or something, the ones that don't match, you know. You know, we get out the matching glass cups, you know. King Solomon, you know, here, here's a gold cup, you know. Incredible. Show me, show me celebrities that have this kind of level of wealth. There aren't any. Nope. Verse 22. For the king had at sea a navy of Tharshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tharshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom, and all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Now it's interesting there because his navy was so powerful they didn't even have to worry about anybody fighting them. It's just like, go on out and get me more riches, you know. I have uh, 666 talents of gold this year. Let's see if we can double that next year, you know. Just incredible. Absolutely amazing. You know, oh, well, I think that some celebrities today are, you know, pretty cool. Nothing compared to King Solomon. Nothing at all. What about his wisdom? Well, I already read verse 24. I went too far there, but let's read it again. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which Solomon had put in his own heart. Is that what it says? No, it says, which God had put in his heart. Remember back there where we were reading about uh, Queen of Sheba, how she came and she was asking him all these hard questions and he answered everything. And it said about uh, that uh, there was nothing hid from the king. Well, what's that talking about? That means God revealed it to him. There wasn't anything like he was stumped and went, uh, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh Every question she had, God said, here's the answer. Here's the answer. Here's the answer. You know, just amazing. He was a very intelligent man. Uh, continuing on here, verse 25. And they brought every man his present vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots, and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. <laughs> you know, you go out there on the lane, there's a bunch of little, all the stones out there. That's like what silver was, you know. Just amazing. And cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for six hundred shekels of silver, and an horse for an hundred and fifty. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria did they bring them out by their means. Everybody was coming to King Solomon to hear his wisdom, and they were willing to pay for it. All right, he was a very intelligent man, and if you want to read some of his the wisdom that God gave to him, you can read the book of Proverbs. You know, you hear the the you know the musings of these different great minds and stuff through history, sick mind Freud and Albert Einstein and all these guys. They can't come close to the book of Proverbs. I mean, just incredible the wisdom that is in the book of Proverbs. Uh, but continuing here, what about women? Was he popular with the ladies, <laughs> as they say? Look at First Kings chapter 11. Now here's his downfall. First Kings chapter 11, verse 1. 
But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Now, what does the term strange women mean? It's defined right there in the verse. It doesn't mean that they were funny looking. It just means that they were strange as in strangers to Israel. They were not of the race of the Jewish people. He loved many women of other races. You can read Song of Solomon, actually, and he's, it's one of his lovers that's writing about him, and she says that she's black. Okay? That's what it means. Verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Big mistake. And he had 700 wives, look at this, princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. How many women did he have to choose from? Total? 1,000. Now I'm not going to try to get, I don't want to get too graphic here or anything, but show me any Hollywood celebrity that has been with a 1,000 different women. I doubt it. And the women that they are with, you know, would be prostitutes or one night stands, fornication kind of thing. That's not what's going on here. These are wives that were true to King Solomon and wouldn't cheat on him. Show me anybody in history that was able to compete with that. None. Nobody. Don't even talk to me about it. You know, people get all excited. Oh, Elizabeth Taylor, she was uh, married eight times or something like that. That's a rookie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> give me a break. Oh, I heard about this one guy and, you know, the one basketball player, Walt Chamberlain or something like that. He was known for a couple hundred or something like that. Big deal. You know, we're talking 1,000 women that are there at any time. And it'll be true and they won't be out cheating on you. You know, these modern celebrities have nothing on King Solomon. And you're going to see why I'm talking about all this stuff here as we continue. Verse 4, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the, or, yeah, the, goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned away from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Unfortunately, Solomon, as great as he was, it's very doubtful that he's in heaven. It looks like towards the end of his life he forsook the Lord and that was it. You see, they didn't have eternal security back there in the Old Testament. All right, it was a faith and works setup. Jesus hadn't come and died on the cross yet. Your sins couldn't be washed away. Okay, they could be covered by the blood of bulls and goats back then, because that's all they had. But he was not eternally secure. So, I would be shocked if he's in heaven. What a shame. What an absolute shame. But it's interesting there, it says in verse 7, Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh? And I think it's that one where it says about... No, no, it's later. It says about the star of your god, Remphan. I think in the book of Amos is where it talks about that. And it's kind of interesting because the symbol for the Jews today on their flag is hexagram. And some people say well, it's the Star of David, and it's more properly called the Seal of Solomon. Because some people say that Solomon, when he departed from the Lord and he got into all this paganism, he actually brought that six-pointed star in, that hexagram. And it's a very wicked symbol. But that's another study. But the whole point is there, the women, these wives that he married, they turned away his heart from the Lord. And I'll tell you how it works. 
Well, if you really love me, you'll, you'll build this temple for me. You'll respect my beliefs. Yeah. Be real careful if you're single and you want to get married. Be real careful not to marry an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because many times they'll turn away your heart from the Lord. To stay, to keep that marriage together, you'll have to do things that are contrary to the Bible. And a lot of people fall for that. And Solomon certainly did. Now, <clears throat> uh, some people would say, well, then I guess King Solomon really lived it up. You know, he really had a good life. He was rich beyond belief. He was wise. He was famous. He had all these women that he could choose from. So then Solomon, I guess, would, you know, towards the end of his life, he'd say, yeah, man, I really lived. Right? Well, let's look about that. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. God does some very interesting things with some of the books in your Bible. This book is unlike any other holy book out there. Your King James Bible is a very unique book. Because one of the books in your King James Bible is actually the memoirs, if you will, of the greatest celebrity that ever lived. And he gets to the end of his life, and he doesn't say, well, let me tell you about this one girl, you know, man, you know. Let me tell you about this gold that I got the one day. He doesn't do that. You see that what happens at the end of the life of a celebrity here in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to start here, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, it, he doesn't say, I am Solomon here, but you... you Look at that, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That was Solomon. All right, he was the one that was the one that followed King David. Now look what he says here about his life as a celebrity. Verse 2. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now if you don't know what vanity means, it means basically if I lived my life in vain, it was a waste of time. That's what he's saying there. Verse 3, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? Isn't that incredible? This guy who was the greatest celebrity attained more wealth, attained more fame and wisdom and all these women and everything. And he says, what was the point? What was the point of this, of this my life that I lived? It's just in vain. Wow, isn't that something? You'd think he'd really be bragging it up, but he isn't. Jump over to chapter 2. Verse 1, we're going to see here what he says about his fame and fortune, all that money that he had, you know, that $1.7 billion in one year. I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I built me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house, also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. When he got old, he didn't go senile or anything like that. His wisdom remained with him. Verse 10, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. There wasn't anything that he didn't do. Okay, he did everything. He had everything. He had all the money. He, he did everything that you could do. And what was his reaction? Look at verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Isn't that something? He looked on everything that he had, all that money, all the riches, all the gardens that he planted, and all the landscaping, and all the cattle, and all the riches, 
all that stuff, and he just went, what a waste. And you know, a lot of these Hollywood celebrities, they'll get to that point. There's a lot of Hollywood celebrities. You can listen to my sermon on suicide. They get to the very top, top of the level movie stars, and they come to a point and they say, what's the point? There's nothing to live for, and they'll kill themselves, commit suicide. Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, all the this wonderful, you know, intelligent man, committed suicide. Why? Because they get to the same point that Solomon got to. They try to find happiness in their possessions here on this earth, and they can't do it. And yet, how many people in America right now, how many young people especially, want to become a celebrity when they grow up? You know, we have this show, American Idol. You know, oh, if I can only be a movie star, I just have to be famous. Why? <laughs> right here's the most famous man that ever lived. He attained everything. There was nothing he didn't attain. There was nothing he didn't do. And yet he said it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. What a waste. Isn't that something? And yet how many people try to become celebrities? They look up to the celebrities. Oh, oh you know, we had Lady Gaga come here to this local area a little while ago and People are just falling over themselves. Oh, she! I can't believe she was here. I bet you she's a tortured soul. I can guarantee it. I bet you she has mental problems. I can pretty much guarantee that. Verse 12. We're going to see about his wisdom. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 12. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? even that which hath been already done. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness, and I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. Let me just stop there for a minute. What's it mean when it says the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness? The wise man will think before he does something. But the fool just go on and do it and, you know, trip and fall and land on their face or something. You know, the fool doesn't think before they do things. That's what's going on there. Verse 15. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that, that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. He says it again. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. And he looks at this guy, the common guy out there on the street that doesn't have $1.7 billion in gold and doesn't have the women and doesn't have this. and doesn't. Have, it's like, that guy's going to live just like me. He has blood in his veins. He has to eat. He has to sleep, just like me. And he's going to die someday, just like me. You know? And it's interesting because a lot of these celebrities that are, you know, very wealthy and affluent, they'll never go around the poor people. A lot of them are going to spend eternity in hell with the common street, you know, prostitute or drug addict. <laughs> they're high and mighty right now. They're big, big shot celebrities but they're going to spend eternity in hell in the same place as somebody that lived on the street. And a lot of these celebrities, they realize that, and it's vanity and vexation of spirit. So we've seen there what Solomon's thoughts were on his fame and fortune. We've seen what he thought about his wisdom. It's just a waste of time. What about the thing of his women? Did he enjoy being married to all those women? Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Turn over there. Did he really say, oh, you know, it was great. You know, oh, I, I didn't care much for the wisdom or for the fame or for the fortune. But, you know, boy, I sure had a great relationship with those thousand women of mine. <laughs> My 700 wives. Did he say that? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 26. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her but the sinner shall be taken by her. <laughs> Don't think too highly of women. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. 
In other words, he looked all those 1,000 women, 700 wives and 300 concubines. He looked at all of them and he said, I can't find one that's any good. <laughs> well, part of it was because he was marrying these strange women from other countries. But, you know, I think part of the solution to having a good marriage is to only be married to one woman, you know. Because then you get to know her, you know, and she has to compromise a little bit to be your wife, and you have to compromise to be her husband, and you kind of learn from each other. Can you do that with a thousand women? No. You know, what's one of the big arguments that happens in marriages? You know, the wife says, you forgot our anniversary. <laughs> Can you imagine having to remember the anniversaries of a thousand women? <laughs> That'd be horrible. <laughs> How about birthdays? <laughs> It'd be bad. There were probably some good women in that thousand number. But how could he ever get to know them? He couldn't. You know? It doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, one woman in a thousand is, is only, you know, any good. It doesn't mean that. It just means that's, you know, what he saw from the whole thing. But uh, Mark 8.36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, nobody embodied that scripture more than King Solomon. Because I do believe towards the end of his life, I do believe he lost his own soul. He departed from the Lord. The Lord was not pleased. We read about that back in 1 Kings. Did he come back on his deathbed? Did he repent of everything? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say about that. We're going to see a little bit later one of his last statement that he wrote. But I don't know. But he definitely fell apart there. Now, I want to show you something else here in this particular book of the Bible, and that is the danger in using Ecclesiastes to teach doctrine. I'm just going to hit a couple subjects here, and then we'll be done. But I just want to point this out, because you have this book, which is written by a celebrity, the greatest celebrity that ever lived, and he's at the end of his life, and he's saying all is vanity, it's all vexation of spirit, and he says a bunch of things that are just his way of, of being, you know, expressing his depression and his, you know, realizing that it was just a wasted life. And a lot of cults will go and they'll take those things that he says and they'll say, this is doctrine now. And they mess up vital Bible doctrine. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. This is one that's used by the amillennial believers. You'll hear this thing used. I've, I've heard this one used many times an amillennial believer does not they believe that we've been in the millennial kingdom now and that christ rules on the earth through his church and through believers and whatever and, and that the earth is always going to be here ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 4 one generation passeth away and another generation cometh but the earth abideth forever All right and they say well see that proves that the earth will never be destroyed but second peter three ten says but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So they say, well then, see that this here, in Ecclesiastes 1.4, contradicts 2 Peter 3.10. Because 2 Peter 3.10 says the earth is going to be burned up. This here says the earth abides forever. How do you answer that? Well, I'll tell you something. Have you ever heard this as a figure of speech? I sent for this thing on the internet, and it took forever to come to me. That's a statement that we have. Man, this, you know, this sermon's taking forever. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean forever. It's just a statement that you have, that you make. And King Solomon, he's there at the end of his life, and he's just like, yeah, you know, one generation is born, another generation is born, and the earth abides forever doesn't mean that the earth isn't going to be destroyed someday. He's using a figure of speech. He's just saying the earth is going to be here. You know, I'm going to be forgotten in a couple generations. The earth abides forever. doesn't mean that that's doctrine now or something. He's just making a statement as somebody who's at the end of their life and realizes they've wasted their whole life. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 Here's another one that you'll hear people make fun of the Bible on this. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. 
Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Now people say, wait a second there. You know, every year they come out with new computers, they come out with new cars, new motorcycles, new airplanes, whatever. That's new, you know, so this is a contradiction, or this is not true. Actually, no, that's not true either. You see, automobiles are just ways of transportation. And if you look at it that way, that modes of transportation, you're just trying to get from here to there. <laughs> you know, well, I have a car now. They used to do it by horse. Yeah, but you're still, it's still a thing of transportation. So what about computers? They had computers back then. Not like we do today that are you have to plug them in and stuff. But they had old ways of, of computing things and reading the signs and stuff like that of heaven and, and you know, sundials and things and, and probably stuff we don't even know about. You know, they had ways of computing things back then. They had ways of travel back then. You know, it's really not new. It's still doing that same thing. Okay, so don't let people cut on the Bible, you know, using that scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. <clears throat> Here's a big one. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. This one's going to be used on you if you ever confront a Jehovah's Witness and you get to talking to him about eternity. They'll use this one. Okay, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know not, I'm sorry, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything, <clears throat> in anything, that is done under the sun. Now, they'll say, well, see, when you die, that's it. There's no resurrection. There's no eternity. You just die and you're forgotten and whatever else. But again, Solomon is speaking of life here on earth being vanity. In other words, he's looking and he's saying, I'm going to be dead soon. And then what? You know, then it's just going to be, I'll, nobody will remember me. I'll just be wasted. You know, just whatever. That's what he's looking at. But see, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. You can't just take one verse and, and apply it as doctrine. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, we won't bother turning there uh, for sake of time, it says here, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's, Paul's saying, Jesus rose from the dead. We too are going to rise from the dead. You don't jump down to uh, verse 20 there in 1 Corinthians 15. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, Old Testament saints go up. Verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. In other words, when you die, it's not, you know, when I'm resurrected, I'm not going to come back looking like this. God's going to give me a new body. Okay, God will give you a new body if you're a Christian. You know, in the resurrection, we're going to be changed. So is there a resurrection? Yeah. You say, well, what about this verse right here? Again, Solomon is talking about here on the earth, the vanity of people living and then they're dead and then they're forgotten that's what he's talking about this is not bible doctrine here in the book of ecclesiastes and when you have somebody running back here to try and disprove verses in your new testament you have a major problem now i'm going to show you another one that's used ecclesiastes chapter 7 ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 And again, remember who we're reading here. We're reading King Solomon, the, this great celebrity. He's at the end of his life. He's very depressed. He realizes he's wasted his life. His wives have taken his heart away from the Lord. And that's the context here. Okay, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. 
Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Well, then, that means that we can't laugh. We can't have feasts. And there in verse 1, the day of death better than, uh, is, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Well, that means we can't have birthdays. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> that's not what that's saying. You know, do you ever hear the statement, you know, it had been better for you that you weren't even born? When I get through with you, you'll wish you weren't even born. Where'd that statement come from? <laughs> right there. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. In other words, you have such a rotten life that you're like, uh, you know, it'll be better for me to just die than, than for me to be born. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a birthday. And those other verses down there, he's saying, I mean, he's at the end of his life, he's realized he's wasted his whole life, and he's just like, I don't even care about laughing anymore. Sorrow is better than laughter. Don't take those verses and say that you can't laugh. And you have to be just somber and going around crying all the time or something. It's not what the Bible's teaching. Be very careful when somebody goes back to the book of Ecclesiastes to prove Bible doctrine. If they can't compare it to other scriptures and it ties in doctrinally, especially the Pauline epistles, which is written to you as a Christian, if there's no clear teaching in the Pauline epistles and they go back here and they overthrow the clear teachings of the Pauline epistles, you're dealing with a heretic. All right? Don't fall for it. Now, what's the conclusion? How does it end up? The great celebrity King Solomon, more wise, more famous, more wealthy, more women than any other man in the history of the world. Nobody compared to King Solomon. Nobody. How's it end up? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. That's where we're going to finish today. You know, a lot of people have this funny notion. They think that if I could just be a celebrity, then I'd be happy. You know, if I could just be rich, and if I could just be famous, and if I could just have lots of girlfriends and whatever, I could be happy. Let's hear how it finishes it up here for this, this great celebrity. Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. What a way to finish up the life of a great celebrity. You know, maybe he did come back to the Lord. I don't know. I have no idea. But it comes out that you're to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you're to keep his commandments. Which, you know, back then they had to do as part of their salvation. For this is the whole duty of man. And by the way, to the celebrities out there, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. A lot of these Hollywood celebrities behind closed doors, they live very, very wicked lives. A lot of those people, I won't get into a big study or a big thing on this, but a lot of them are into the occult. They're into Satanism and witchcraft, and they do some very dark things behind closed doors. And guess what? God sees it, he records it, and they're going to answer for it one day. Now, that's a fearful thing. So there you have it. The greatest celebrity that ever lived had everything that you could possibly achieve on this earth, and he said it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Well, then I guess maybe you better pursue something else with your life, like being in a right relationship with your Creator, with God. True joy and happiness can only come through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and through reading His Word. All right, Whatever happens to you here on this earth as a Christian, you're going to get to live in eternity and have all those riches. Right? You're not going to be very rich down here on this earth if you're a good Christian. Just gonna that's the way it's gonna be. Okay, but at that judgment seat of Christ, that's when you're gonna get your precious stones and your gold and your silver. And you're gonna live in a city that's made of pure gold. 
Now, King Solomon had a lot of things, but he didn't have a whole city that was made out of pure gold. He didn't have streets of gold, like the Bible says heaven's going to be. So we look at this stuff that King Solomon had, and you get kind of like, man, you know, <laughs> $1.7 in physical gold? Boy, what could I do with that kind of money? You know, well, you'd probably get messed up. You know, you'd make a lot of friends very quickly. People that you hadn't seen in years would all of a sudden become your friend again. You know, I've, I mean, I, I saw a program years ago where people were, they were interviewing people that had won the lottery like 10 years later to become millionaires overnight. And, you know, the one guy was like a chronic alcoholic, you know, and in a mental institution. Another woman was like hiding someplace because she had all these people coming trying to steal her money. And, I mean, they were miserable. None of them were happy. And yet, how many of us lust after that in our heart? Boy, if I could just win a million dollars. Just if I just had a million dollars. Don't, you, you don't want that. You know, the Bible talks about back in First Timothy chapter 6, it talks about godliness with contentment is great gain. And King Solomon saw that. He looked out at the common, just nobody guy out there, the little citizen out there, you know, just little farmer. He looked out at him and he was like, you know, that guy's happy. He's got one wife, a couple kids, just a little dumpy house. But look at him. They're having a good time. And he looks back at his riches and he goes, what a waste. You know, what a horrible thing. And that's how a lot of these celebrities are. They get to a point where they, they look out there and, they, and they're just like, I wish I could just be a normal person. Everywhere you go. Oh, it's so-and-so. They're here. Oh, taking their picture and stuff like that. Anything that you do, they were writing about it in the paper and stuff. What a miserable life. Don't lust after those things if you're a Christian. It's a terrible, terrible thing. So that's going to be it for the sermon for this morning. As always, thank you for listening. And uh, if you ever have any ideas or anything, subjects that you have never heard preached on or whatever, Always feel free to contact us. I can't always get to them right away. But uh, I always enjoy challenges like that. But I wanted to put this sermon together in case there are some younger Christians that are listening that are impressed by the celebrities. Don't look up to them. <laughs> They're God's enemies, first of all. And secondly, most of them are miserable. That's why you hear about them on drugs all the time. You don't need to take drugs if you're happy in life. You take drugs to forget reality, to leave reality. So that's going to be it. Thank you. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.